Good morning, everyone. Today I'm speaking with John Siddons, who's a registered organizational uh, psychologist and has recently written a, a really fabulous article in our Massage Journal entitled Coping Skills in the Current Crisis, uh, which we'll unpack a little bit during this interview with John. Good morning, John. Yeah, good morning, Dave. So obviously, um, COVID-19 crisis has been really difficult for all of us. Um, how can someone recognize the difference uh, between just general anxiety and, and potentially suffering from uh, an anxiety disorder or struggling with, with mental health, health in general? Yeah, well, look, uh, Dave, that's a good question because, I mean, the, the, the most common um, anxiety disorder is called generalised anxiety disorder. And that's where people are anxious most days and they're also worrying about things like, um, you know, their mortgage, their, their lifestyle, um, money issues, um, a whole range of issues are just always on their mind. And, and there's that worry component that sort of has a, a, a frequency and intensity about it. Mm. And that would, and that if that's happening for, say, longer than six months, uh, basically what, um, what the um, gauge is, then that could be called a general anxiety disorder. That, that's, that's separate to just general stress um, mm. in the COVID crisis. Or, okay. or separate to everyone's normal worry that we all do. Sure. But it's more fretting kind of worrying. It's 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 an extreme um, type of worrying as opposed to just the normal stresses and strains that we have in our day to day life. Because over three million Australians live with anxiety and depression. So obviously this particular climate that we're in ramps things up for a lot of people out there. It really does, Dave. It, it really ramps things up. And, and one of the things we talk about um, is that people look at some of these, um, they can they can Google these days and, and look at DSM-3, the Diagnostic Manual, and say, oh, generalised anxiety disorder. Gee, I worry a bit. Oh, I must have it. <laughs> now, that in itself is not good because that's what we call symptom stress or, or secondary um, stress or secondary anxiety, that is being anxious about being anxious or being stressed about being stressed or but worried about being worried. And I find that that is uh, uh, an issue that plays out a lot with, with clients over the years because the, the issue is that it, it's completely normal to be worried. I mean, humans worry. Mm. This notion, oh, I shouldn't worry or, hey, I'm a psychologist, I don't worry. Well, you know, you can tell porkies to your clients if you want to, or you can be real and honest. And, and the, the reality is that we all worry, but and particularly in a COVID climate. So what, what I want to see from um, clients is just to make sure that they're, they're saying, well, look, it is an unusual situation. Um, things aren't normal. Um, and for the, for the reasons that we keep hearing on the news around the COVID issue and, and, and work and, and how, and particularly people whose um, work has been, restructured, uh, some may be really, um, really suffering in, in terms of work and may not have much work at all mm. uh, on the JobKeeper allowance. But the, the key thing is to say that it is normal to feel stressed right now, uh, but I can, I can cope with these feelings because uh, I have a plan of action that I've put into place. Mm. And that's where it, 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 we may talk about that later, but that in terms of your own uh, plan of action, of action, which is both mental, spiritual, and physical, and um, people need to stick to their plan of action, um, and that's important because everyone needs a, a plan, mm. and to not feel like oh I'm trapped inside the house because you are actually allowed to go out of the house, providing it is for exercise or for essentials and the like. So that's where um, it's important to to do exercise, to, 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 to realise the importance of endorphins, which comes from 30 minutes of exercise. But um, one of the things as a psychologist that it's important for me not to do is say, oh, you must do the exercise that I'm into. Um, Dave, you were, you were talking about um, your surfing earlier before the interview started. Um, you know, I'm not a surfer. Um, so for me, it would be a different type of exercise to you. Sure. Um, so, and, and you weren't suggesting that, but the issue is that for whatever someone's into um, is, is what they're into and they should do more of it. If they're into it because they enjoy it, it's because it's, there's a passion there, an interest in it. And as simple as walking, um, it could be bike riding, it could be um, doing Pilates or various forms of uh, uh, strength training. Um, although gyms are hard to come to, but could be literally using a gym ball, a gym uh, ball, um, and 
and uh, f- sorry, Fitball, I should say, mm-hmm. and um, actually working on that for a, for an hour or so in the evening. And everyone has a different strategy, but this the key thing is to get the release of these endorphins that comes after, as I say, around half an hour of exercise, and that is really important for mental health. Okay. But you can do it in a variety of ways. Now, um, having read the article, and it was a fabulous uh, article, John, it was really clear uh, and well written. So, and you broke it down into um, bypass techniques, uh, and you gave little snippets of some of the, I guess, some of the strategies that we can use. This, and we're talking about ourselves here. We're not talking about our clients on the table at the moment, but we will get to that as well. But um, as as far as a therapist is concerned, these little bypass techniques. Do you want to little, unpack that a little bit for people? who may not have read the article yet, uh, and I, I highly encourage you to, uh, you guys, it's in the Massage Journal. Uh, but John, can you just sort of expand on um, that particular article that you wrote in the journal? Yeah, sure, Dave. I mean, <clears throat> part of the issue is that people, um, you know, uh, the, the cognitive behavioural just means your attitude, how you're thinking, but also the actions and the behaviour that you want to put into place. And um, what we're saying here is that for example, if you um, think of a, a task you can, you can, that you've got to do, and you might say, look, I've got six hours of uh, therapy I've got to do, <clears throat> and, um, you know, I'm not looking forward to that. But if you can actually slice and dice it, and if you can um, actually break it up or break the day up, then it becomes much more much more um, palatable and easier to, to actually cope with. For example... So man- manageable bites as opposed to that, something that's, like it, that's The whole notion of manageable bites, um, if you think of a long, greasy salami, it's important to, if in itself, it's not palatable, savoury or inviting, but if you slice it into its components, uh, you put it on a, a, a cracker with some cheese and tomato, it becomes inviting, it becomes tasty, it becomes something that, that you'd want to have. Now, the same goes with a task. If you can actually, as you say, manageable bites, um, slice and dice it and actually realize that um you know one small part of the task is done then i'll do another small tar- part of, of the task so i'll actually look at all the various steps in the task uh and then eventually as i do one task and i do the next step and then i do another step um ultimately i will finish that report or you know complete more sessions but i'm not sort of thinking at two ahead of myself and saying oh, i've got a you know 22 page report to write I haven't even done the introduction. That becomes overwhelming, and you wonder. It's little wonder people procrastinate, and and people avoid it, and that's where people turn to coping strategies. And they may be maladaptive coping strategies like alcohol, <coughs> or um, any other type of uh, maladaptive strategy. And um, it, it's important that people actually realise that you know they don't have to be overwhelmed by any challenging task. It's just one step at a time, literally, and slicing and dicing it and, and making these things into manageable bites um, and, and rewarding themselves for, you know, I've finished the introduction. Gee, I've finished two sessions this morning and they went well. And I noticed one of those people was uh, duffing on them, but I moved them on and, and we did a good session. I stuck to my knitting uh, and that's what I do. Gee, I'm feeling good. Now it's lunchtime. So that's where a quick walk comes into it. So, it's keeping to to a to a strategy, but um, planning for the worst, but expecting the best, and and realizing that even if I have a, a really difficult client, I have a plan in place, which we may talk about later, that I can actually implement to deal with that really difficult client, because mm-hmm. um, they will happen. Life won't be perfect. Uh, you will will run over time, as we know, um, and there's a bit of a, an allowance um, for that lunch break. It might be technically an hour, but in reality, it's only half an hour, but you're you're happy with that because you've got a bit of flexibility there to, in case you do run over, run over um, with, with particular clients. So John, John, let's let's widen the net here as well. So rather than, um, well, we've just been focusing on self, but um, widen the net to family and friends now. So as far as looking for, I guess, signs um, that people aren't coping, can you sort of give us an idea on what people should be looking for as far as you know those around us and maybe um in some ways Mm. in which they can be supported well i I think the first thing you've got to look at is that this comes under a number of different categories um it can be physical it can be cognitive or the thinking style now the physical as you guys would know in terms of the, the 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 general muscle pain 
Um, it could be shoulder pain. It, it could be being, you know, sweating, profusely sweating, um, just being on edge generally. Mm. Um, now, the behavioural side of it, which is where salami technique and other type of techniques come into it, like worst first approach or usually um, visual imagery techniques to imagine yourself actually completing a, a job interview and how you're going to go through that and actually being in a relaxed state when you do it. Um, the important thing is that if you're seeing a friend or a, or a loved one um, who sim simply is, is avoiding things or, or they're just not concentrating or they're just not sleeping, that's more the behavioural side of it. Um, and that's where you can sort of help the person. I mean, the feeling side of it is they're, they're keyed up. They may be talking very fast, sort of rapid fire approach to things in, in their conversation. They may be irritable. That's, that's sort of on the feeling side. But being a, uh, a friend to someone um, or, or dealing with a family member, it, it's not appropriate to go into sort of pseudo counselling or psychotherapy yeah. Even if you you did have that, you know, you might have done a course in it, but it, but it's even myself, you know, in my with my background, it's not appropriate for me to to think that I can counsel, you know, my brother or or or, or my wife because it just doesn't work, uh, as we know. Uh, I've tried it, believe me, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but but what does work um, is certainly uh, applying things like um, the salami technique, uh, applying things like the worst first approach. Let's get the worst thing out of the way. Uh, applying techniques like, let's try the 10 minute plan. What I want you to do, I uh, see so you're getting frustrated about that report you're writing and I know it's eight o'clock at night. How, uh, you, at least you've got a few days to do it, but how about you just do 10 minutes of it now? Because if we, if we can just do the 10 minutes, that'll get you off the mark, just like a, a, a run in a game of cricket. And then you can take it from there. And, and then you feel like, you know, you've gone to bed and you've actually started that introduction. So it's, it's just getting off the mark, but also rewarding yourself. And I think that uh, B.F. Skinner did a great thing in, in the uh, late 40s by inventing positive reinforcement. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, the so-called, it's overused uh, example of the smart dolphin at SeaWorld, at SeaWorld you know, actually um, uh, jumping up through the loop um, and, and, and uh, you know, it's full of fire, the, the actual, uh, you know, be able to jump through that loop full of fire and doing it seemingly um, naturally. Of course, it's been rewarded very slowly. The dolphin didn't initially want to jump in the air at all, but obviously they gave the, the, the dolphin fish and then people don't like fire, mammals don't like fire. And eventually, you know, by giving positive reinforcement more fish, the, the, the dolphin said, yeah, I'll jump through that loop and I'll actually jump through it and I will, um, I, I want the fish. So the same thing has to go here is that, you know, we need to reinforce ourselves. We need to reward ourselves, mm. even, even if it is in the 10 minute plan for 10 minutes of work on a task that we're avoiding. Because the key thing in, in relation to anxiety, uh, a key factor, I'm not saying the only factor because some <laughs> of it's in style, is procrastination and avoiding things. And we all, we're all humans. We avoid things that we can't stand. Um, but with a um, combination of uh, slicing and dicing and, and, and breaking it into its component compa compartments and actually, um, you know, doing a 10-minute plan and not awfulizing the task and even maybe doing some visual imagery mm -hmm. and imagining yourself doing it, you know, doing that job interview, being reasonably relaxed and talking it through can be really can be really useful and, and can can help people because I think we tend to to bite off more than we can chew and think we can just do that report right here and now but uh, the brain doesn't work that way great and, tips uh, yeah yeah fantastic hey um let's let's turn to uh, practitioner client relationships here and this has always been a bit of a uh, a gray area for some therapists to to stay within the scope of practice so when we're dealing at a time where potentially there is more anxiety out there in the community, and uh, in most cases, a lot of therapists are uh, treating at the moment, um, <clears throat> even with COVID around, what, talking about barriers and boundaries as far as, you know, that discussion that takes place between the, the practitioner and the client patient on the table. Do you want to sort of um, give your opinion on, on where that sort of line should be drawn because it's a really important point and again uh there'll be people that will argue for and against 
getting involved emotionally with patients. Um, but yeah, where do you stand with uh, massage myotherapy therapists? Uh, that's a really good question, Dave, I, because it is because it's complex. But on the other hand, um, you can take a lot of the complexity out of it. Um, the reality is that there there often is a some kind of emotional relationship with patients. I mean, you can't get away from that. I mean, it could be at a basic level, but it, obviously it needs to be at a fairly basic level. Um, the, the issue is that um, a, a myotherapist needs to be grounded. Um, they need to clearly listen to their patient. But at the same time, they're not psychotherapists, nor sh nor do they want to be, uh, I would suggest, nor, nor should they be, uh, number two, because their job is to do what they do. And what they do, they do it really well. And the other thing is that it's, it's a really important for a, a myotherapist to realise that, you know, if they're taking on, if they're trying to be, say, for example, a pseudo-therapist, or let's say they actually are a therapist on the side and they have training in it, um, they're trying to do too many jobs. I mean, they're, they're taking too much on. And why would they want to do that? And also, by, by taking too much on, they may not be doing it as well as they could if they were focused on, on the task at hand. So I'd always suggest that, you know, again, it comes down to this salami-type technique where you're breaking it down in, in its component parts, but you're also focusing on what I need to do right now. Now, if, if the, the issue is someone says, look, uh, uh, thanks for this massage, yes, you're really working on my neck well, I appreciate that. I want to download to you about my current girlfriend and she's a this and she's a that. Um, that's the time that the barriers need to be clear. And the first thing you can do is say, look, you know, I appreciate that, Jim. That's, that sounds very like there's a lot of issues with her. Oh, and she's a this, she's a that. They're not buying into that. And if, if it continues, they need to be clear and say, well, it sounds like you could, you should uh, perhaps talk to your GP and get 10 subsidised sessions with a psychologist because they would really be able to deal with those kind of issues. Oh, no, I want you to deal with it. Well, um, unfortunately, I'm just not trained. I don't have the background in that area, and I, nor do I expect to, uh, nor would I um, even attempt to pretend that I do to you. So I have to be very honest with you. But it sounds like, um, you know, there's some real issues in regards to your um, girlfriend and I would encourage that. And they're subsidised sessions, you know. And that type of approach, then then simply going back to the job and saying, how about now I work on uh, the the uh, lower back? Because you mentioned mm. the lower back, there were some issues. So I want to work on that now. And just keeping that focus. And I think that you have to be show some sympathy, but no longer than a minute or so uh, or a couple of minutes. Uh, and then moving that person back to the job at hand or what, what the myotherapist does well. And that's the sensation, that's the massage, that's having that physical contact. So it, 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 look, it, there is a, 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 an emotional relationship on a basic level, of course, and rapport is important and mm. listening is important, but it shouldn't go any further than that. Otherwise, they're just being dumped on it and they're, being, um, pa they're not being paid to do a job, which they may not be qualified to do. And why would you do that? Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, yeah, it's so it's, it's so important in that relationship because it can get you in trouble and literally get you in trouble. Um, uh, and you know, finish up with an ethics case. So it's a it's an important okay. um, boundary to respect as a therapist. So it's it's that's great um, that's great tips for for everyone out there on on that particular issue. Um, John, just finally. Um, I just wanted to say, firstly, thank you for coming on today. It's it's incredibly appropriate for the time that we're in um, to have someone like yourself uh, to, to speak to our industry, um, our therapists out there, our membership um, about the issues, because what we've talked about issues concerning self, we've talked about issues concerning those around us as well. Uh, and also now on that sort of uh, that practitioner um, patient client relationship. So we've covered a lot of territory there. Is there anything else that you'd wanted to finish up on as far as the interview today? No, I think just uh, making sure that um, people do look after themselves and 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 and, and just realize that they they have got what's called um, they have got what's called what's called high frustration tolerance and high discomfort anxiety. So um, you know, to manage those feelings, to manage the discomfort, anxiety that just ordinarily comes with our with our job, that's a part of our job, mm. and so that they can stand it, 
Um, so we don't want we what we don't what's called we don't want people to have I can't stand an itis uh, and that I can't stand this because no matter how the, the challenge is that if you've got a very difficult client to put that plan in place that we talked about and then reward yourself and say look I got one of the most difficult clients who was dumping on me was talking about everything from my mother mother-in-law to the to mum to the girlfriend to who knows what and thought it was a great opportunity to get some free psychotherapy, but you've actually created those boundaries. But having said that, um, you know, it may be lunchtime and you can feel the stress. Well, once again, it's natural to feel stress if you've had difficult clients. So to be easy on ourselves, I think I think the key thing, if, if, if I can make this point, that people should not feel like they have to do two or three jobs um, when they're only there to do one job. Uh, in, and, and secondly, to not be perfectionists because... No one needs to be perfect at what they do. We aim for high standards, and I, I realise that. You've mentioned that there are very high standards and, and people you talk to, um, you know, maintain those high standards, and that's great. But the facts are uh, no one's perfect. So, you know, we don't have to do everything perfectly and just to be a bit easier on ourselves, particularly in this COVID climate. I think it's very important. Mm, absolutely. My, my only point uh, that I'd like to make is for all those vegetarians out there, you can replace salami with the maybe a cucumber when you're thinking about that technique. John, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show uh, and uh, wish you all the best. Um, if people wanted to get in touch with you um, as far as, because you're actually in clinic, yeah? Yeah, I am. Um, they can go on my um, website and uh, I have a, um, a mobile number. Um, yeah, I'll, pop I don't the, know I'll, I'll pop the website below. Yes, um, yeah. it's, it's, it's all on the website. Um, siddons.com.au, www.siddons.com.au, and they can have a look at the website and take it from there. All right, fantastic. Once again, John, thanks for joining us. And everyone, thanks again for listening. See you next time. Hello, Christine Knox here. I was so excited to be coming to the conference this May, but unfortunately, that hasn't quite happened. So I'm super happy to tell you that I will be coming to the conference as an exhibitor in 2021. I'm so excited to be coming to Adelaide and um, I hope you all have a healthy and happy remainder of 2020 and look forward to seeing you all in 2021.